Welcome to Protein and Enzymes Part 9. At this part, we've definitely shifted into the enzyme portion, and here we're going to look at what inhibits enzymes. Let's get started. Alrighty, so what are enzyme inhibitors, right? So let's remember that enzymes are um, proteins that catalyze um, biochemical reactions. And so an inhibitor, then, is any compound or environmental condition that prevents the enzyme from performing its function, which is catalysis. Alrighty. Okay, so there are um, two different types of inhibitors. There are nonspecific and specific. So for right now, we'll just focus on nonspecific. So this means that they're very, like, they're very global. They will, these are things that affect um, all enzymes. And so I'm sure several of these can come to mind because we're talking about catalysis of reactions and things that we know that influence reactions are temperature and pH. So let's look a little more closely at the, um, the exact consequences of how temperature and pH affect um, enzymes. So let's look at temperature first. Right, so if we think back to collision theory and what's going on for reactions to occur, we, um, we learned that initially, right, as we increase the temperature, we're increasing the kinetic energy, right? So here's temperature along the x-axis and reaction rate along the y-axis. So as we increase the temperature, as we would expect, we increase the reaction rate because we're bringing in more kinetic energy so there's more energy available for um, interactions and collisions between reactants, and it, it allows them to get to the transition state. All right, but then, right, so that's um, not too surprising. An increase in temperature will increase the rate of a catalyzed reaction, but up to a point, more is not always better. At a particular temperature, though, we get to the maximum and then any further increase in temperature forces a decrease in the reaction rate. And why is that? So now we have to think about the structure of our enzyme. And what happens is we begin to denature the enzyme. So in this portion of the curve, the increase in temperature, right? So then now the enzyme is denaturing. Right, at elevated, we'll just say, because every enzyme has its own, own range, all right? And, um, right, and so then over here, right, getting to, this is just classic collision theory, as we increase the temperature, we increase, increase the collision energy, right? And so um, we get to the, where we can get to the minimum energy, or the, so we have more and more um, of our reactants um, at activation energy. Okay. Now we'll look at the other nonspecific inhibitor, which is pH. And thinking about all of the R groups on enzymes and how they interact to create tertiary structure and that sort of thing, and that, that that's very electrostatic dependent. We can see that catalytic activity of enzymes definitely depends on pH. And there's typically a well-defined optimum point for catalytic activity. So while within the body we can think about physiological pH at 7.4, there are regions of our, um, of, our, of our body that do have different pHs, particularly for the digestive system. So if we look at pepsin right here, look at, notice where its optimum pH is, really close to pH 2. So imagine um, where you think pe we would find pepsin, right? Where in our body do we have such a low pH, right? So pepsin is a digestive enzyme in our stomach. And so we recognize, right, with the, um, with the stomach acid, our stomach, right, is at about pH, pH 2 or so. So we see that for the enzyme pepsin, its optimum pH is where we think about stomach acid. Um, then conversely, let's look at trypsin. 
when we look at the enzyme trypsin, we can see that its maximum is very close to a pH of 8. So then if we think about in our body where we would find this, um, this more basic condition, right? Trypsin we find in the small intestine. Um, and it helps to, to digest various substances. So um, notice that the optimum pH is similar to the pH of the small intestine. Alrighty. Now, so that's pretty much it for nonspecific inhibition. So now we will um, we'll look at um, specific inhibition more closely. So we'll go to the next page. And um, there are a variety of um, specific inhibitors out there. So we're not going to go through all of them, but we'll go through, we'll go through some of the, the major ones. All right. So the first idea when we're thinking about specific inhibition is there is competitive versus non-competitive. Okay. So here we're back to our enzyme substrate complex, right? So this would be the catalyzed reaction happening. And so um, it's very um, literal, right? So the, comp the competitive inhibitor is interacting at the binding site where we would normally see the substrate. Right? So that's a direct competition for the active site of the, um, the substrate. Right? So competitive is a direct competition. However, there is an alternate form of competition, and that's the non-competitive. And that's shown right here, right? So this box is going with competitive inhibition. And then for non-competitive, there is a, a binding site that the substrate doesn't care about, right? The substrate doesn't care about this binding site at all. This is where the non-competitive in inhibitor comes in. So with non-competitive inhibition, the activity of the enzyme is controlled by the binding of an activator or an inhibitor at a location other than the active site. And so when the non-competitive inhibitor is present, right, the substrate no longer fits. So the substrate no longer fits into, um, I guess, its active site. So we can start to recognize, remembering that enzymes are huge biological molecules. Many of them have molar masses 30, 50, 100,000 grams per mole. So, um, so this is a good thing to bring into our awareness is that um, there, an enzyme can have more than one active site. Um, then when we can look a little more closely, um, and this, th these are all interconnected, we can look at um, feedback inhibition. Um, so an idea of feedback inhibition is that we um, regulate an enzyme's activity using a product of a reaction later in the pathway. So typically, most biochemical pathways will have several reactive steps. And so if, we, if our body has A in hand and wants to produce Z, it'll go through a series, you know, substrate A will go through a series of tr chemical transformations to get to our end product. Um, but what happens then is one of the end products becomes an inhibitor for an enzyme early in the pathway. And this is a common strategy because this is very efficient for the body. Typically, when we have feedback inhibition, um, one of the later products will inhibit early in the pathway to save the body the resources of making these um, unnecessary intermediates. All right. So when and um, you can see that this is very self-regulating, right? So if our body needs Z, the switch gets turned on through chemical communication, and A starts producing Z. Once there, our body has enough Z. Right? Then it says, okay, there's enough of me. It comes back and says, you can stop now. There's enough. So it's um, very efficient. Let's look at a, um, a specific example. 
All right, and maybe I should be a little more explicit here, right? So basically, um, right, so Z, um, right, so sufficient, so sufficient Z will then cause um, inhibition, then Z um, triggers inhibition of additional production. Okay. Um, alrighty, so here's an example. Um, the, um, the amino acid um, threonine can be converted into isoleucine. And the, um, the first enzyme in this pathway is threonine deaminase. So we can imagine something's happening with the amine group. Um, Alrighty, so, um, however, I isoleucine bonds, right, to a different site on the enzyme and changes the conformation so that threonine no longer binds properly, right? So how could we describe um, isoleucine, right? So isoleucine is a non-competitive inhibitor right, of threonine deaminase. Okay, so it comes back, and then we stop the pathway, all right? So, um, so non-competitive inhibition is a frequent mechanism for feedback inhibition. Since we have changes in the structure from the final product and the substrate. Okay, and then there's one more, um, one more um, terminology that um, we should talk about with non-competitive inhibition, and that is allosteric control. And in some ways, allosteric control seems very similar to non-competitive inhibition. I think the main thing here is that we um, recognize that it could also be activation. So um, this pretty much is very like synonyms as much as I can tell, right? So let's, um, let's look here. So the difference is we'll talk about it being a positive regulator, right, versus a negative regulator, right? So a positive regulator is going to increase um, increase catalysis. And very logically, a negative regula regulator will decrease catalysis. Alrighty. So we can see that it's basically um, non, um, the non-competitive inhibition. So here is our active site for our substrate. And we see that without the allosteric regulator, the active site is unavailable. As soon as the allosteric regulator comes in, then we see that we've opened the active site, and now the substrate can enter. So now the reaction begins. So reactivity begins. Okay, conversely, with the negative allosteric control, um, here we could see that the enzyme is quite happy to interact with the substrate all is well, right? So right now we would have reactivity occurring. Okay, the enzyme can do its thing, catalyzing the reaction for this substrate. However, once the negative allosteric regulator comes in and interacts with the enzyme, now the substrate can't get in, right? So reactivity, reactivity stops. Okay, so um, that pretty much wraps up um, how we inhibit and regulate enzymes. So please take some time now to um, Use these concepts to solve a few homework problems.